Welcome to part two on our segment related to Italian um, Baroque painting and sculpture. Um, in this segment we're going to be focusing on painting, um, in particular an artist named Caravaggio. Um, and Caravaggio arrived in Rome from Milan in, um, in 1592. Once there he began to paint very productive provocative and technically accomplished pictures for um, a small sophisticated circle associated with the household of an art patron, um, Cardinal Del Monte. Um, this is where Caravag Caravaggio is invited to reside. Um, his subjects from this early period include still lifes, genre scenes um, featuring fortune tellers, um, and you know, glamorous young men dressed as musicians or mythological creatures. As you can see, um, this is an example of one of those. Um, he takes off to Rome to become an artist without a benefactor or sponsor. So this is something important and not um, traditional. You know, usually an artist to work full time would need some sort of benefactor. You know, we saw with Michelangelo that you know the Pope Julius II, you know, gave him a lot of commissions. Um, and so that was that was pretty risky for him to do. Um, and Caravaggio lived in the streets. Um, so he's sort of what we think of as this modern artist, this sort of starving, you know, um, artist who who isn't, um, you know, being um, taken care of by a patron. And, you know, again, it's it's Caravaggio who begins this modern notion of the tormented, highly intelligent, starving artist that we think of. He was a very heavy drinker. Um, with a temper, and was frequently jailed. Um, in 1606, it has been recorded that he killed an opponent after a tennis match, and there are very different variations to that story. Um, he had to flee Rome and ended up going to Sicily. After a long, crazy journey um, there, he eventually was granted a pardon by the Pope, um, but died before he could return back to Rome. Um, what was so innovative um, in his paintings is that he used people from the streets as his models. And that's something important to think about when we look at this particular image. Um, so this is actually a self-portrait um, of Caravaggio. Some art historians think um, it's called Boy with Basket. Um, and he incorporates still life. Um, when you look at the still life, um, the, the, the fruit is very lush. And it's almost rotting, and the leaves are shriveled up. And so um, it's very exotic and sort of what some people might call erotic fruit because it's just so ripe or overly ripe. Um, a genre scene is a, like a scene of everyday life. So it's not a religious scene or a historical battle scene. Um, it's, it's, it's just sort of normal everyday life. Realism. Um, is something that he started to incorporate, this illusion of realism. Here, the basket, the detail of the basket and the fruit. I mean, it almost looks like you could, you know, bite into to one of those, um, to one of those um, pieces of fruit. And also the way the basket is coming, almost coming off the edge into our space. Um, tenebrism is an important term, T-E-N-E-B-R-I-S-M. Um, it's from the Italian tenebroso, meaning murky, also called dramatic illumination. And it's a style of painting used very, uh, that uses very pronounced chiaroscuro, which is that, um, you know, that um, contrast of light and dark. And so there's a very violent contrast of light and dark where the darkness becomes a very dominant feature of the image. The technique was developed to, again, add drama to an image through a spotlight effect and was very popular during the Baroque period. So you can really start to see this effect of tenebrism, this you know, light and dark shadows, but it's, it's much more contrasty or not as, um, as maybe a subtle transition as, as, we, as, as we've seen other artists use chiaroscuro. Um, so Caravaggio, I think when you look at the, this self-portrait, he has a very seductive treatment of the figure with the shirt falling off the shoulder. And again, you know, Caravaggio has, you know, some of his work has been described as homoerotic, and he may or may not have been a homosexual. Um, he eventually did find a sponsor to help with his career. So... Here's another image done by Caravaggio, and this is a depiction of Bacchus, the god of wine. 
Um, it's innovative because while it's a mythological subject, it's not an idealized god um, that we would think, uh, you know, being portrayed because he used a regular person um, as the model. Um, this is something important. He would actually use people from the streets to be his models, and he didn't idealize them. When you look closely, you can see the tan lines, how his face is tan, his hands are tan, and, you know, where his shirt would be on is white. Um, so he's not trying to idealize these figures um, the way, you know, artists before would have done that um, with, a, with a god figure. So it's innovative because he's portraying Bacchus as a, a genre person, um, an everyday person, uh, instead of as a god. Here you can look more at the detail. And again, look at the lush treatment he does with the still life and, and sort of this um, headdress um, that he depicts, the grapes, and um, very exquisite detail. And again, here's a, de uh, a detail of sort of the rotting fruit um, that was very characteristic of Caravaggio. Again, I pointed this out earlier, but you can really get a better sense of the tan line um, that we see right here from his hand, you know, to his arm here. And this signifies that he's a laborer, that he's working out in the sun. And again, he really doesn't look like a god. He looks like a regular person dressed up as a god. Um, there's a suggestive gesture of his hand about to untie the bow um, that's holding his garment. So again, there is some sort of eroticism infused into the subject. So while Car Caravaggio acknowledges the fiction of the image, he's also introducing an idea of realism we have not seen in art before. So this is very innovative and very new. Um, no one before would have portrayed a god um, in this manner or using a regular model and, and not idealizing um, the subject. So this was very innovative. This was very modern. So after 1600, Caravaggio began to receive important church commissions, um, presumably facilitated by Cardinal Del Monte, who, um, as the Medici representative at the Vatican, was well connected to religious um, luminaries. Among the most significant of his early works was um, were paintings commissioned for the side walls of the Contrelli Chapel in the Roman Church of San Luigi de <laughs> Franesi. Um, and again, there is the spelling right there, and I'm probably doing a horrible job pronouncing it. We're actually going to be he painted both of these paintings. This is um, the calling of St. Matthew. We're going to, I'm sorry, this is, this is um, a different, this is, this is the painting we're going to be looking at, the calling of St. Matthew. Um, he also did this painting, but we don't have time to talk about it. So he was also doing oil painting on canvas. Um, viewers encountering the painting um, obliquely across the empty space of the chapel interior seem to be witnessing the scene as it occurs. You know, it's elevated on sort of a recessed um, stage um, opening through the walls before them. So again, in addition to the painting, the architecture, um, you know, and the way it's placed around the painting is again important and, and again part of that sort of Baroque um, style that incorporates, you know, painting, sculpture, and, and architecture all into one setting. Um, unlike the Renaissance where frescoes were painted directly onto damp plaster and spread over walls, Caravaggio started producing large oil, oil paintings on canvas within his studio and then later transporting them for installation within the chapel where they would um, form a coordinated um, ensemble. So, you know, remember with Italy, they really liked fresco and so you can actually see that this is an example of a fresco up here. Um, but, you know, Caravaggio was one of the first Italians that really started to use oil painting um, and then you would paint on canvas and then they would mount the canvas Canvas, um, you know, in you know, on the wall. Um, so he was actually painting in his studio. So here is the close-up of the painting we're going to be talking about. This is Caravaggio, Calling of Saint Matthew, and the Contarelli. I think that's how you say it. Chapel. 
Um, so this painting is a prime example of how powerful um, frank realism um, and theatrical spotlighting and dramatic gestures that Caravaggio introduced into Roman Baroque painting um, would become. Um, so I hope when you look at this, um, you really do see it as different than some of the other paintings um, that we've looked at. Um, one of the things that hopefully you picked up on was this intense sort of raking light um, that enters the painting from the upper right corner. Um, as if it was coming from the chapel's actual window above the altar to highlight the important features of this darkened scene. Um, here is um, a, a Bible, a scene um, from the Bible, the calling of Levi. And so the painting is portraying an event in Jesus' Jesus's ministry when he called Levi, a tax collector, to be one of his apostles. Levi, who will become St. Matthew, sits at a table counting or collecting money. He is surrounded by elegant young men in plumed hats, right here, um, velvet doublets and satin shirts, so they're, they're sort of dandies. Um, on the right, nearly hidden behind the back um, of a beckoning apostle, who's probably St. Peter, a gaunt-faced Jesus, I'm sorry, this is St. Peter, a gaunt-faced Jesus points dramatically at Levi. So again, it's a very, this is also this effect of tenebrism, this really um, harsh light and dark contrast. It, um, so there were explicit directions that were given to Caravaggio um, for this commission. Um, the commissioning document for the calling of St. Matthew was explicit. It required Caravaggio to show the saint rising from his seat to follow Christ. Um, <laughs> Um, to into his ministry. But Caravaggio was never very good at following directions. Among a group of smartly dressed Romans who form Matthew's circle of cohorts seated at the table to the left, no one is rising to leave. Art historians have not even been able to agree on which figure is Matthew. So this is something different. So, you know, some people think it's him, like he's pointing to himself. Um, you know, maybe he's pointing to this guy. So it's it's unclear who Levi is and who will eventually become um, St. Matthew. Um, also, the use of cellar lighting. Um, so this room is depicted as being below ground level. And this is not a typical setting for the depiction of this story. So again, this is a religious narrative. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's depicted in a genre scene in everyday life in the bottom of, you know, the basement of some cellar. So nothing idealized about this, um, um, this religious narrative. And then he um, depicts a couple of these dandy adolescents who are very absorbed and engrossed in counting money. So it's a very realistic um, scene. So this is a, a depiction of the calling of St. Matthew from the Italian Renaissance. And I think you can really see um, how different um, this painting is. You know, here Christ is featured in the middle. Um, and, you know, definitely we see that this figure most likely, you know, he's sort of, you know, leading him is um, St. Matthew. So it's it's quite different, you know, the lack of tenebrism. It's it's outdoors and in this sort of um, city, um, you know, probably Jerusalem. Um, so it, it's very, very different than um, Caravaggio's depiction, which is, it looks like, you know, they're hanging out down in a bar. <laughs> um, and here, you know, Christ is not idealized um, either. So let's talk about the tenebrism of, of this painting again. It comes from the Italian um, tenebroso, murky. Um, it's a very pronounced form of chiaroscura, where there's um, sort of a violent contrast of light and dark. Um, and the artist Caravaggio is generally credited with the invention of this style, although this technique was used much earlier by various artists such as Albert um, Dürer, who we, we met um, when we were looking at the Northern Renaissance, um, and a couple of other Renaissance painters that we, we were not able to discuss. Um, 
So again, tenebrism is a, a oops, an important vocabulary term that you should need to know, and it's really this sort of contrast of light and dark, where you know the dark is really the main focus, and there's a sort of lost and found contour where parts of the subject seem to fade into the shadow, and then you have these really dramatic um, highlighted um, values because of this sort of low light situation going on with this this you know light coming through this one window. So remember, Baroque style was um, was a style that um, the the Catholic um, Counter Reformation embraced, um, and so the underlying subject here is this idea of conversion, which was again a common theme in the Counter Reformation art. Um, in 1563, the Council of Trent had called for the art that would rouse Catholic piety. Um, in the face of Protestant revolt that had been gaining momentum during the 16th century. And Caravaggio was part of a new generation of Baroque artists who brought fresh approaches to narrative presentations and painting styles and subject matter um, that would realize these counter-reformation objectives. So they really wanted um, art to be more emotional and for the viewers to have more of an emotional connection um, and sort of a dramatic um, style. Where the you know the Reformation was more simplistic and severe. So let's look at a few details of this painting. Um, most identify Matthew as the bearded man in the center, um, interpreting his pointing gesture as self-referential, um, and you know questioning response to to Jesus's gestural call. So it's like he's saying, "Who me?" So most art historians agree that this is probably Saint Matthew. Some see him, um, but some see him in the figure that's hunched over the scattered coins at the far left, um, seemingly unmoved by Jesus' presence. In this case, the bearded figure pointing would be toward the figure, questioning whether his bent over colleague <laughs> was the one Jesus um, was, was seeking. So again, there's that sort of ambiguity that, you know, Caravaggio deliberately and I think intended and, you know, again, didn't follow um, the specific instructions set forth by the, the patron of this painting. So here, let's look at the other side of the painting where Christ is depicted. And we see Christ is emerging from the dark, and you can barely see him. And so again, this is unusual um, for Christ you know, to be depicted in the shadows. And hopefully this seems familiar to you. This is why I wanted to show you um, the scene um, from the Sistine Chapel, um, the creation of Adam. And so you can see we definitely have uh, another artist here, Caravaggio, referencing another artist, uh, Michelangelo. So he's quoting Michelangelo's creation of Adam from the Sistine Chapel. Has, um, you know, he has that sort of flipped hand, but he's flipped the hands. Um, so Christ's um, hand has a limp gesture like Adam. And remember, Adam... Um, is, is, you know, Jesus is supposed to signal or is supposed to represent the second Adam. Um, so it's very symbolic, um, this, this quoting of Michelangelo. Remember that, you know, Adam was sort of um, lifeless and, and sleepy looking, and the idea was that Christ, um, God had not ignited life into him yet. Um, and so he sort of switched that um, scenario, and now Jesus has the limp hand. Um, and again, just, you know, referencing that he is the, the second Adam. So here, when we look at the calling of St. Matthew by Caravaggio, we see that he's changed the iconography of this narration so drastically. Um, the viewer is led in by this, this light and this tenebrism. Um, we see the questioning gaze of the seated figures. Christ returns um, the gaze, and we realize who Matthew is. Um, and so it's a very unexpected and so, sort of surprising depiction of this story. Um, Caravaggio um, is able to parallel the process of Matthew's conversion um, and out of understanding of the painting at the time. Um, and so he's sort of uh, genreized, you know, making, you know, general life. Um, I don't want to say general, but he's he's making this sort of sacred narrative, uh, like a genre scene or a scene that would happen um, in everyday life. Um, and so this commission that he completed really ignites his career. 
So this is another painting done by Caravaggio. This is the entombment. Um, and I want you to note the extreme illusion um, that he has brought to the painting. You know, look at the figure of Christ. You know, he's very muscular and very articulated. Um, also, this, uh, this sort of illusion of, of space where the slab of rock that they are um, featured on is really jutting out into our space. Um, so the use of naturalism in the depiction of Christ is also very evident because he looks dead. You know, again, he's not idealized. Um, and, and Caravaggio is depicting the moment the apostles are about to place him into his tomb. Um, they're lowering they're lowering him into our space. Um, so literally the altar of the church becomes a tomb. Um, and so this is really this is really well done. You know, there's a thoughtfulness about it about it. And you know, this element of of, of you know, there's a thoughtful element about um, the ritual of of what's happening here with the painting. And so they're really lowering Christ into our space. And again, this is really feeds into the drama, the emotional connection with the viewer looking up at this painting. So here's an earlier version of the entombment that we looked at. This is the mannerist um, style um, um, from Pantormo. Um, and I want you to compare and contrast um, these two depictions. What's different about them? What's similar? Um, and, you know, definitely the color palette is very different and, you know, obviously the space, um, you know, is more, you know, Caravaggio is depicting more illusionistic space while, remember, mannerism dealt with this sort of irrational, sort of compressed space. Um, and, you know, the depiction of the figures definitely are, are much more um, real and natural looking than these sort of rubbery <laughs> kind of um, elongated figures of, uh, of the Mannerist style. So when we look at some details of this painting, again, the use of naturalism and that these, um, you know, these aren't idealized figures. Um, these are, you know, probably people off the street that he used as models. Um, you know, Joseph um, is depicted as barefoot. Um, oops. I think I went too far. Um, you know, there's also, when we look at the figure of Jesus, there's a great naturalism on his face. Um, you know, there are wrinkles, there's um, sunburn and age depicted. And again, this really um, signifies that um, he, he used regular a regular person as the model of Christ, as opposed, and, in in, in, you know, not idealizing the figure of Christ, that this is just, you know, he's, he's like every man, just a normal everyday man. And this was very powerful, you know, this was something new and really resonated with people um, because of this, this, you know, it's very raw um, emotion, you know, emotion involved here. Again, Caravaggio was a great admirer of Mar Michelangelo, and so you see here that he is quoting that arm that we saw um, from the sculpture of Michelangelo's Pieta. Um, so again, art referencing art, a very modern concept. And really what's um, very intriguing about this painting is the arrangement of the figures. And it's really quite complex when you really look at it in detail. Um, there's almost this sort of um, crescendo of figures increasing in scale. Um, you know, you have, you have the figure of Joseph, you know, hunched over, and then you have these figures, you know, hunched over trying to lower Christ, and then you have this figure a little bit higher up and you know this figure mourning and then finally the the last figure of Mary Magdalene and she sort of releases um, it's sort of like a climax um, that comes you know to the top of the right hand corner with Mary Magdalene where she sort of releases this this grief into the air and so that really again adds to this idea of drama and tension and emotion so in conclusion, um, Caravaggio's entombment really is a, a very innovative, sensitive treatment of this um, religious narrative um, and how it functions in the church. So 
We're going to be looking, this is our last painting that we're going to be looking at uh, um, from Caravaggio. Um, this is Death of the Virgin. Um, and it was rejected um, for the Santa Maria della Scala in Rome. Um, this was, um, these were nuns who wanted this commission, and when they saw it, <laughs> they absolutely hated it um, and were disgusted. So take a look at the painting. Think of maybe why they might not have been so crazy about this image of, of Mary um, and her death. While you're thinking about it, um, I wanted to show you um, some other scenes. Um, again, these are, um, you know, um, other depictions from, from the Renaissance and early Renaissance. Um, some, you know, Huger van der Goes is, is Northern Renaissance. But when you look at these scenes, Caravaggio really de deviated from the high Renaissance painting of these subjects. Um, in earlier versions, the Virgin is typically laid out in the center, as you can see in the two examples before you. Um, and, and there's sort of the signals, and the idea is that she signals a telepathic communication where disciples immediately come and surround her. Um, Christ then comes down to carry her soul to heaven. Um, the body is organized and composed, the hands are crossing the chest, and again, a very idealized presentation of, of um, the deceased Mary. Now, when you look at Caravaggio's, um, you can really see how he deviated from the scene, um, from the typical earlier depictions. Um, note the use of the cellar light, you know, the sort of light coming in from this window. It looks like they're, again, in sort of a dark, dingy, you know, basement. Um, the use of tenebrism. Um, there's a sharp diagonal to the composition with the figure of Mary. Um, and these figures as well, and then this diagonal line here with that cellar light. Um, and as the figures get closer to the figure of Mary, you can see how their grief intensifies. So like the image I showed you before of the entombment, you know, here the figures in this part of the picture seem more calm and serene, and as you move closer to the figure, of the dead Mary, they become more complex and emotional, and again, the sort of release of grief. Um, and even to the point where Mary Magdalene over here is in a fetal position. Here's a, here's a, um, a detail of that. And also we get a detail of the figure of Mary um, and hopefully maybe you figured out that the reasons why the nuns were so um, offended was that the figure of the figure of the virgin is almost sprawled out. I mean, she's really in this unidealized pose, and she looks dead. Um, and so the nuns thought Caravaggio had actually used a dead prostitute as the model um, for the figure of Mary. Um, and so that, you know, and he, he probably did, you know, you never know. Um, and the critics were very upset by this depiction and the unrelenting realism of the scene. Um, you know, but I think it's very powerful. And again, you know, it certainly made an impression, um, um, I'm sure, to, to the viewers of this painting. Here's a, another overview of it. Um, so quite powerful, and um, you know Caravaggio is one of those great masters. Um, in addition to like Michelangelo, he had a, a, a pretty, um, you know, unique personality, and it's interesting to read about his life. So that's the end of segment two on Baroque um, painting and sculpture, Italian painting and sculpture. Um, so hopefully you have enjoyed that. We will be traveling in our next video and looking at the Baroque style um, in Northern Europe. So stay tuned.